So, we're going to continue with our next part. I'm going to run through a few quotes. That will kind of give us the foundation for going into study of life. So this is the first quote. Comes from Science of the Times, September 19, 1906, paragraph 1. It says, A knowledge of the Word of God depends not so much upon strength of intellect as upon pureness of purpose. The simplicity of an earnest, dependent faith. To those who in humility of heart seek for divine guidance, angels of God draw near. The Holy Spirit is given to open to them the rich treasures of truth. <laughs> Many of us, when we live our life, we walk to the edge of the Red Sea. And we read about the story of the Red Sea. But when it comes for us, when it comes time for us to put our foot in the Red Sea, we tell God, you part the Red Sea first and I put my foot. Mm. 
But then God says, no, you put your foot in, then I'll part the Red Sea. But then we say to God, no, you part the Red Sea first, then I put my foot Many Adventists live their life. We all, many of us live our lives as if, uh, as if we don't believe that God will part the Red Sea for us. And I think the saddest thing will be for many who don't make it to heaven is when they look, when, when God reveals to them their life, how many times they walk to the, ridge of the, the edge of the Red Sea and they walk away. One of the principles that our church, uh, you know, our church board runs our church. Is that every year when we come together to plan our strategies for the next year? We look for projects to do that we don't have enough money for. Because when you don't have enough money to do the projects, the only thing you can do is pray. But you have to force yourself into those positions. You have to push yourself into the positions where you can ask God to part the Red Sea for you. Many of our church leaders, our uh, pastors, our um, mission presidents, our conference presidents, our union presidents, uh, many times nowadays we, I know because I sit on the Exco for union and for mission, so I can say this, uh, many times we try to live within what we can do. And so when we study the Bible and we say, we see that God parted the Red Sea, we see that God stopped the sun for Joshua, we see that God brought uh, fire out of uh, heaven for Elijah, we ought to believe that He will do it in our time. So this is how we develop our earnest, dependent faith. And when you, when you study the Bible, you believe it and you act upon it. God will give you more knowledge. But if you study the Bible and you don't live it out, you don't act upon it, you will not get more knowledge. Because God has brought you to the edge of the Red Sea and He says, put your foot in. If you don't put your foot in, he's not going to open up somewhere. He's not going to open up a mountain so you can go that way because he wants you to go this way. So we need to have that earnest dependence. Okay, next quote. I believe this is 
higher place 138.3. Because the, the mere reading of the word will not accomplish the result designed of heaven. It must be studied and cherished in the heart. The knowledge of God is not gained without mental effort. We should diligently study the Bible, asking God for the aid of the Holy Spirit that we may understand His Word. Um, <laughs> So this is saying that we need to take effort, we need to take time to study the Bible. If you don't put effort into studying the Bible, if you just read it like, let's say you just read uh, a chapter or a couple of chapters every day without thinking about it, you won't really get much. So you can't just kind of read through, browse through it. You need to think about it. You need to digest it. It's better for you to study less and spend more time studying the same thing than for you to read more. Yes. You're going to have to reconnect it. Oh, I have to reconnect it. Sorry. Okay. I don't know if kind of want to kill your presentation. I'll do it. So, this is a similar uh, passage to the one before. Uh, this one signs of the Times, October 3, 1906, paragraph 5. Uh, do not read the word in the light of former opinions. Do not try to make everything agree with your creed. With a mind free from prejudice, search the word carefully. If, as you read, conviction comes and you see that your cherished opinions are not in harmony with the word, do not try to make the word fit these opinions. Do not allow what you have believed or practiced in the past to control your understanding. Open the eyes of your mind to behold wondrous things out of the world. Thank you. 
So I'm going to talk about this from two angles. One as a non-believer or somebody who's just been baptized, and then somebody as an Adventist. So just because you grew up hearing something in Adventist church, it doesn't mean that it's correct. And you'll see this, uh, we're going to study some passages that many of you think you know, and uh, you might see something new in it. Every time I come across passages that I've studied before, I always pray that the Lord will show me something new. And many times He does. So every time you come to the study of the Bible, if you've studied it before, you should come at it with fresh mind. Don't think that I studied it before, I know all these things, and therefore it's saying these things. So, uh, let me give you an example. The common interpretation for uh, Daniel chapter 2 the ten toes uh, the ten countries of Europe Everyone heard that before? Or maybe not. Yes. Yes. Now that is prophetically not consistent with Daniel chapter 7. Because in Daniel chapter 7 it talks about 10 horns. Correct? But what happens to three of them? Three of them disappear, right? So therefore, three of the toes in the ten toes should be crushed. Does it make sense? So the ten toes of the feet of Daniel are not the ten countries of Europe. And actually, the iron and clay of the feet, iron represents what? What is iron? In Daniel chapter 2, what represents iron? No, what, what represents which country, which empire is represented by Rome, right? So Rome, so the iron and clay of the feet are Rome and clay. It's a combination of Rome and clay. Does that make sense? So iron represents Rome, the Roman Empire, in this last empire. And what is clay? What is clay represented by? The church, right? Or God's people. Uh, I'm the potter, you are the clay. I am the part, you are the clay. So the feet of iron and clay represent a combination of 
Rome plus Church. And the ten toes do not represent the ten countries or the ten tribes of barbarian tribes of Europe because three of them disappear, therefore three of them should be crushed. So there's an inconsistency in prophetic interpretation if you maintain that interpretation. And even up till today, many pastors, many um, uh, academics, so much from our schools teach that that is the case. So that's just one example. And I'll show you some more examples as we go a little bit. How can it be consistent because uh, Daniel chapter 2 talks about the 10 European kingdoms? That's yes. what we understand. Yes. Yeah, I come from a Hindu background and that's what I was explained to. Right. And I accepted that uh, sure. explanation. Yeah. And they have shown it to us in the history. Okay? Right. That's Daniel 7. Seven. fulfilled in history. Yes. And then the ten horns of Daniel 7. Exactly. Three of them fell. Yes. Okay? And that is also the history. Yes. So, no, no. of course, it's all of these ten uh, European kingdoms that are in ten toes, iron and clay. Yeah. There is Rome and there is church, both are bigger. No, because the feet of iron and clay represents a little horn. Sorry, I, the, I did not the feet of iron and clay represents the little form. No. Yes, it does. Feet of iron and clay is ten European kingdoms. No, it's not. It's not. I can prove it to you, but we'll take it offline. I just want to give you give you something to think about here, right? Just because you have been taught it all your life doesn't mean it's always right. As you study the Bible more and more, you will there are new things yet to be discovered. Uh, I'll show you. Uh, but I mean, just briefly, iron and clay represents Rome plus church. Okay? Clay is pot, potter's clay. It used, if you look at the passage in Daniel chapter 2, it says it went from miry clay, sorry, potter's clay to miry clay. Potter's clay is something that's useful, miry clay is dirt. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. so uh, it, it's, it's a claim, right? So, Rome plus church. That's what the feet of iron and clay represent. So, simplest interpretation of that is a Roman church. So, um, we'll, we'll come to that. We'll, we'll discuss further in the. We can take it offline, I guess. But I just wanted to show you an example that. There are, uh, interpretation is constantly changing and uh, I've seen, and, and I'll show you some quotes where Ellen White says that there is new truth for us to discover, still. So, from a Buddhist perspective, I want you know, what this passage is saying is, when you come to Christianity, you cannot bring your beliefs of Buddhism and mix it with the Bible. And at least over the years that I have spent here, I used to live here from 2002, 2003 to 2005. And uh, we used to study with um, uh, some Buddhists 
แล้วก็ได้ศึกษาเพิ่มพีกับคนชาวพุทธ and I know that as uh, one of the things that um, she this lady I was studying with she struggled with was the concept of meditation แล้วก็ผู้หญิงคนนี้ที่ข้าพเจ้าสอนรอบทีเนี่ยมันจะมีความไม่สามารถที่จะเข้าใจได้อย่างแข็งแพ้ถึงการ meditation คือการนั่งวิปัสสนาสมาธินั่งสมาธิ because meditation for a Buddhist is very different from the Bible or biblical concept of meditation meditation ของชาวพุทธคือการนั่งวิปัสสนานั่งสมาธิมันต่างกับ meditation ของคริสเตียนชิชเช So again, as you study these concepts from the Bible, you must be prepared to put aside what you believed before. เพราะฉะนั้นเมื่อเราศึกษาพระธรรมของพระเจ้าเราจะต้องปล่อยวางความคิดเก่าๆที่เราเคยมี Otherwise, it will twist our understanding. Otherwise, it will twist. ไม่เช่นนั้นมันจะทำให้ผิดเบื้องความเข้าใจของเราได้ The new truths that we will discover will not contradict the old truths that are already established. In the spirit of prophecy, it shouldn't this uh, it shouldn't contradict the spirit of prophecy. Right? Yeah. Yes. So how about the uh, ten toes? What is the spirit of prophecy say about the ten toes? Uh, if you can find something for me, then uh, we can discuss it. But I I don't have anything on the ten toes from the spirit of prophecy. Uh, but let's take it offline. Uh, maybe I'll open a can of worms that we shouldn't have opened. But let's take it offline on that one. Okay. Uh, but yeah, if, if you can find something on spirit of prophecy uh, that says the ten toes are the ten countries of Europe, then uh, that's fine. You know, then we shouldn't come. We should not debate that at all. Uh, but you won't find it, uh, at least not from my my research. But if you have something, I'm, I'm happy to look at it. But let's let's take that offline. Okay, can we go to the next slide? So uh, we talked about this already, planning, right? Um, Make sure. Yeah. So. เมื่อเช้าเราได้พูดไปแล้วว่าการเตรียมตัวซึ่งเราจะต้องจัดเรื่องต่างๆสำคัญ Prioritize a specific time. Get focus. Do whatever is needed to wake up. Uh, organize your devotion. Switch off your mobile. Switch off your Wi-Fi. Find a private place. Uh, and plan your study. ก็คือเราจะต้องจัดลำดับความสำคัญของเวลาจัดจัดเวลาแล้วเราต้องตั้งมีสมาธิแล้วก็ทำอะไรก็ตามที่ทำได้เพื่อเราจะได้ตื่นแล้วก็อย่างเช่นนอนแบบข้ามเอาไปออกร่างกายหรือว่าเดินไปอาบน้ำหรือดื่มน้ำแล้วก็ออกวางแผนงานในการที่จะนมัสการตอนเช้าอย่างเช่นปิดโทรศัพท์มือถือปิด Wi-Fi เป็นต้น When we're not used to you doing our devotion When we are not used to doing our devotion, ถ้าเราไม่เคยคุ้นเคยกับการนมัสการหรือเฝ้าเดี่ยวนะ the devil will try to distract you every day. ซาตานก็พยายามที่จะดึงความสนใจของเราออกไปทุกวัน So if you want to make sure you do your devotion the next morning, you need to prepare the day before. เพราะนั้นถ้าเราจะมีการเฝ้าเดียวในวันพรุ่งนี้เราจะต้องเตรียมตัวตั้งแต่คืนนี้ You need to pray the day before that God will wake you up the next day เราจะต้องอธิษฐานก่อนหนึ่งวันหมายถึงว่าคืนนี้ว่าให้พระเจ้าปลุกเรา And when you finish your morning devotion you need to pray that God will help you to keep your appointment with Him in the evening แล้วก็เมื่อเรานมัสการเฝ้าเดียวเสร็จแล้วตอนเช้าเราก็ต้องอธิษฐานให้พระเจ้าช่วยให้เราได้นมัสการเฝ้าเดียวกับพระองค์ใน and and he will answer that prayer และพระองค์จะตอบคำอธิษฐานของเรา but if you don't pray it แต่ถ้าเราไม่อธิษฐาน you will just be swept away เราก็จะถูกล่อลวงให้ไปทำอย่างอื่น and you will forget and you will แล้วเราก็จะลืม91.1. Never should the Bible be studied without prayer. 
Before opening its pages, we should ask for the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit and the Holy And this last quote, it says, Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be, Take me, O Lord, as holy thine. I lay all my plans at thy feet. Use me today in thy service. Abide with me and let all my work be wrought in thee. ให้เราอธิษฐานว่าขอพระองค์ทรงรับเราไว้ให้เป็นของพระองค์แต่ผู้เดียวข้าขอฝากแผนงานของพระองค์ข้าไว้กับเบื้องพระบาทของพระองค
And you will find that she connects it with other verses that you had not thought to connect it with. So a good way to learn how to study the Bible, a good way to learn how to study the Bible is to read some of her uh, to read some of her books and copy out the Bible text that she has in that chapter. So for example, uh, Christ Object Lessons. So look at, if you go to one of the uh, chapters on one of the parables, and you copy out all the Bible texts that she mentions in relation to that parable, and then you try to connect all the Bible verses, sometimes you have to do a bit more research to figure out how she connected one Bible text to another Bible text. Because she doesn't give you the other Bible texts. So she might give you uh, A and she might give you C, but she doesn't give you B. And so you have to research to find the connecting Bible text between these two texts. So studying some of her books like Christ Object Lessons, of course the Conflict of the Ages series, she has many Bible texts in there that jump from New Testament to Old Testament. Uh, no, is our ages? We only have four five books. Oh, okay. Well, whichever of those books you have, if you read them, copy out the Bible texts. And she and see how she links them together. And that's a good way to learn. The third one is the concordance. So, okay, so concordance is uh, for the knowing, looking at the, when you study the English, then you can find the Greek or the Hebrew word. And it will explain for you the meaning of the Greek and the Hebrew. Why is it important to use a concordance? Because sometimes the English word doesn't really explain the true meaning of the word until you look at the Hebrew or the Greek. And also, if you search for the English word, you may get the wrong interpretation. So let me give you an example. If you search for the word love, you will get a lot of unrelated Bible texts from all over the Bible. 
เราถ้าเราหาคําว่าความรักจากพระคีเนี่ยเราจะได้มากมายเลยที่มันไม่เกี่ยวข้องกับความรักเดิมเดิมที่ข้อนั้นพูดถึง because in the uh, in the Greek there are many meanings of the word love เพราะว่าภาษากรีกเนี่ยมันมีความหมายของความรักสามประการ you have agape love มันมีอาคาเป้อาคาเป้ความรัก which is God's love ซึ่งเป็นหมายถึงความรักของพระเจ้า and then you have filial love แล้วก็มี filial love เป็นความรักประเภท filial which is brotherly love ก็คือความรักระหว่างชันพี่น้อง and there's And third and fourth and fifth, uh, I think third and fourth, right? There's four different definitions of love in the Bible itself. So if you want to accurately connect verses together, many times you have to use the Hebrew or the Greek words to do the search for the word. And today that's very easy because you don't even need to know the Hebrew or Greek. You just search for the number. So there is a symbol like H and then a number. For the Hebrew word, and you just search H and the number to find all the instances where it is found. ไม่ทราบว่าภาษาไทยเราเคยเห็นไหมที่บางทีแล้วก็มีตัวอักษรว่า H หรือหรือว่า G แล้วก็มีตัวเลขตามด้วย Yeah, and if it's a Greek word, then it's G. ถ้าเป็นภาษาอังกฤษก็จะเป็นตัวย่อ G. ถ้าเป็นฮีบรูก็จะเป็น H. So none of us needs to be Hebrew scholars. To be able to search and find the connections of these Hebrew words and connect these verses together. You just need some software on your phone or on your laptop. Now, of course, uh, the Adventist, uh, our Adventist Bible commentary is also a good supplementary reading. And then the Hebrew and Greek lexicon. If you want to go even deeper into that Hebrew or Greek word, it's a dictionary. And then, of course, history books. If you're studying like the books of Daniel, uh, you want to know the history behind some of these prophecies. Um, go and get. Uh, there's some good historical books written by, um, you know, some of our pioneers, like A.T. Jones. He was a historian, so he wrote uh, some books like uh, Ecclesiastical Empire. So it was written by A.T. Jones, uh, our one of our former uh, presidents. หนังสืออีกเล่มหนึ่งที่เหมาะสมในการศึกษาพระคีก็คือหนังสือประวัติศาสตร์อย่างเช่นเอทีโจนเนี่ยเป็นนักประวัติศาสตร์ด้วยซึ่งเป็นประธานสำนักงานใหญ่ของเราเนี่ยนานแล้วท่านก็เป็นเขียนหนังสือประวัติศาสตร์ด้วย and his book uh, his history books are particularly important for uh, Daniel chapter eleven หนังสือของเอทีโจนเนี่ยมีความสำคัญต่อการเข้าใจพระธรรมดาเนียบทที่สิบเอ็ด So, yes. Question. Yeah. The SDA Bible commentary is it necessary when it comes from there? Means it's quite honestly. Um, not all of it's coming from the system. Some of it is history. So there's a, there's a lot of historical stuff in there. So the quotation comes. There's some quote. Yeah, of course there's there's quotes. So it's quite obvious when it's a quote from. The Do you have any way to comment the Bible commentary? Yes. On each um, many of the different verses, but most of the explanation comes from the Bible scholars.
So, I mean, uh, typically you would use it a lot for the history. There's a lot of history in the uh, SDR countries. Does uh, anyone have any other questions? Before? Yes. Um, so, something that I always find challenging is being consistent with my Bible with my study. So, um, I'll start off thinking, okay, I'm going to read through Matthew, but read through the life of Christ. And then somebody says, oh, you know, you, you, you know every Adventist needs to read. You know there's certain chapters of that every Adventist needs to know this chapter inside out and back to front. So, right. okay, I might skip to that because that seems important. And then maybe um, so, because somebody preaches a sermon on, I don't know, Romans and this, this is really important, so I might, I might right. skip to that. I'm getting bits and pieces, but sure. I'm sometimes the, like, the, I, I don't, I don't think, like, I don't, I don't have any feelings that that's not quite the way the Bible should be studied. Right. And so I'd like some advice on like, is it, is it all just important and should we just all push, is there stuff that we just, you know, we, we have to study, prioritize, study this first and I get really confused about what to study because there's always new information about what's important, what's current, what, sure. what I should be doing. So uh, I guess I'll share with you how I do my devotions. Um, I don't think there's a right place to start or a wrong place to start, uh, except maybe if you're just new to the church, probably don't start in Revelation. <laughs> there's no right or wrong. For me, I just find it easier to follow the, the topics of Sabbath school. Because if you want to dig deep into something, you want to be able to be talking about it multiple times. So whatever is a topic that Sabbath school is studying, you're going to be talking about it at Sabbath school, right? So one good way is to follow the topics of the quarter that's been studied on. Uh, and I recommend uh, you know, sticking, being disciplined with studying uh, the Bible in by that book as, it, as it's being studied out. I, I recommend uh, being disciplined and just studying that book instead of jumping around everywhere. Now, there are many times where I will study the same chapter over and over and over again. Because studying the Bible is like digging for gold. Not every day you're going to find uh, the big piece of gold. But you've got to persist. And it happens enough times that you get excited and you know it's going to come out. It, it happens enough times that you found the goal that you know that it will come. It's like practicing the piano. Uh, you got to practice it over and over and over again. And not every day you enjoy practicing the piano. Now, how do I supplement that? 
How do I supplement? How do I what how do I add to that? Um, so for me when I have burdens of my heart. So for example, like right now my daughter is seven, so she's getting to the age where you know we need to start a kind of formal education with her. So half my devotional time, I will read child guidance. Or I will look for the topics. I will look for the topics of the spirit of prophecy that are helping me with the burden of my heart. And it's generally easier to grasp something out of the spirit of prophecy than it is out of the Bible. The Bible you've got to read many times over and over again, same chapter, same verses, uh, before something special emerges. Now, you can still get something out of what you read, but if you're a deep Bible student and you're trying to dig for that gold, you have to dig, like, many times. Help me if I translate wrong, you stop me. <laughs> but spirit of prophecy, spirit of prophecy, I can read it and I can relate to it immediately. Like it can speak to me directly. Does that make sense? So you need to read. Well, I found that it's helpful for me to read both. I will read the Bible following the topics of spirit of, of, of the Sabbath school that we're studying. And I will use spirit of prophecy to help me with some of the burdens of my heart. So if you have a relationship issue or you're worried about your family, marriage issue, or even just in general, you want to read something that's going to speak to your heart. You know, read half, read a spirit of prophecy book for the second half of your devotion. Okay. Any other questions? Me, Sorry? I want to ask anyone who Yeah, uh, there's many tools. So, ESOR is, is probably the most popular for Windows. So, principle of studying the Bible. Uh, let's go to Isaiah 28 and verse 10. Isaiah 28 and verse 10. This is the principle that we should use for studying the Bible. How do I know? Because Sister White references this text when it comes to how to study the Bible. Isaiah 28 verse 10, it says, A precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, 
line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. What does this mean? Precept is like a teaching or a command. So what Isaiah is saying is that we need to put the teachings one upon another. It needs to link together. So concept must be a concept. So the concept, as we study a book of the Bible, you will find that each section needs to, it builds upon each other. But a concept or a teaching is made up of verses. And the verses must, we must study, we must learn to study the Bible line upon line. When you read the Bible line upon line, instead of jumping here and there and everywhere, you will realize the that verse, what does it mean in relation to all the other verses around it? This is what we call contextual Bible study. Contextual Bible study. So, uh, I read all those verses together to understand how it lines up. What's the context? And when I understand line upon line, then I know how to use the Bible text here a little and there a little. So that when I connect the Bible text to another Bible text, I know before I connect it, what is that Bible text doing in that chapter first? So the here a little simply means I'm taking the Bible text and then I'm trying to connect it here a little, there a little, to connect that text with other texts. So when you take a word like love or agape and then you find where else in the Bible it talks about agape that's what we call a word study but before you do that word study you must understand why is that verse there in that chapter? Why is that verse there in that chapter? Um, we'll discuss this further as we move along. So, just a couple more uh, Bible texts. Ah, uh, sorry, uh, Spirit of Prophecy quotes. This one says, uh, this is uh, Signs of the Times of Heaven 19, 1906, paragraph 3. It says, No one with a spirit to appreciate its teachings can read a single passage from the Bible without gaining from it some helpful thought. But the most valuable teaching of the Bible is not gained by occasional or disconnected study. So to your point um, before. Uh, its great system of truth is not so presented as to be discerned by the careless or hasty reader. Many of its treasures lie far beneath the surface and can be obtained only by diligent research and continuous effort. The truths that go to make up a, a great whole 
must be searched up and gathered up here a little and there a little. จากด้านจากการอ่านคัมภีร์อ่าคิวเอิร์ดโดยไม่ได้รับการช่วยเหลือของอ่าเกี่ยวกับคำสอนของคัมภีร์ที่มีคุณค่ามากที่สุดเน
ข้อความหรือประโยคเดียวที่ศึกษาจนมันชัดเจนในความเข้าใจแอนด์อินฟิเชนจุดแล้วก็ซึ่งมันมีผลต่อเนื่องกับแผนการช่วยให้รอดเป็นให้เห็นประจักษ์ is or m o r มันจะมีประโยชน์มากกว่าการอ่านหลายรายบทโดยไม่มีเป้าหมายการอ่านแล้วก็จะไม่ได้ประโยชน์อะไร so uh... Take your time to study the Bible. Don't feel like you have to rush through and study the full Bible in one year. Don't feel like you have to rush through and study many chapters per day. This quote is basically telling us it's better for you to study less verses than for you to study a lot and not be able to understand. Just press the, the long one.